Yeah, yeah. Your, your yeah. office is in Brunswick. Yeah. Your yeah. yeah. office is in Windsor. Without spending time going through your 12 months of your Twitter feed, what's really got your goat the last year? Well, uh, I think what's upset me the most in the last couple of months, um, not that I disagreed with the you know, whole concept of point of consumption, I did agree with it. I do think it's, it should be a level fair playing field in terms of um, you know, a UK, you know, a UK bet from a UK customer should be paying into the UK um, ta uh, UK revenues and should be paying into UK racing and everything else like that. I agree with that. I agree with that concept. Um, I'm aware that the larger concerns are experts in moving the money around. Um, I know that it won't deal with the problem um, in its entirety. It's only a part ways. Um, but what's vexed me the most since that point of consumption um, has come in is my fees and the fees of all the independents, uh, all the independent bookmakers. Um, and it has to be said at the outset that the independent bookmakers went down in one year last year, they went down by 17%. 17% of, of the independent businesses went out of business last year in one year alone. So they're under pressure out there. Um, and so in a way, I, you know, I guess I'm speaking for them. Mm -hmm. um, but what landed on my plate landed on my doormat actually and fractured the concrete underneath <laughs> the mat was the Gambling Commission's bill. Now I run a small website, we have a couple of thousand customers um, and we look after them and everything like that. And of course in order to provide a service for them, we, you know, you have to, you know, give, give the modern day customer all the various tools that he's used to from big firms in terms of betting. You need to give them an app, you need to give them a an interactive website, you need to give them competitive prices. Well, we seek to do all that as a company, of course we do. Um, but for my little small company, and um, we were landed with a bill from the Gambit Commission um, for running my website of £13,500. So this is a license fee. It's the minimum charge. So it, it, it for a bookmaker running a little betting shop in Devon, who decides to run a little website for his customers and take bets if they want to, which I would think would be a natural progression in business if you want to survive. It's, it's, the internet is the way things are going. Yeah. The very minimum charge, as laid down by the DCMS and backed up by the Gambling Commission, and I say backed up because they've done nothing about these charges. They've not argued them down uh, right. significantly. Um, they, so we got a charge of £13,500. Now, to put it into perspective for people um, that are watching yeah, this, yeah. Um, a company such as Bet365, a super giant in the betting, in the betting world, a super giant, uh, with 14 million customers and 5 million, they say, uh, 5 or 3 million active customers will pay a fee to the Gambling Commission of under 150 grand. So this means that my little firm and all little firms like like mine are worth more than 11, 12 percent of Bet365 or Betfair or William Hill. These are super global companies, and their websites are extremely advanced. They're, they've got millions of customers, but yet we appear to be. In fact, we no, not appear to, but we are subsidising these operations through our gambling commission fees. I mean, to ask a little operator to pay £13,500 for what is a natural progression in business because Jenny Williams of the Gambling Commission is ill-prepared to see the merits of or, the, or take the case forward to the DCMS. She's in charge of the Gambling Commission um, and it's e evident that she's completely ambivalent about the situation. It doesn't, doesn't matter to her whether a few independents go out of business because their costs are excessive. Um, it, she, she can't see the parallel um, as a civil servant that, you know, little companies shouldn't be even close to these firms. Um, and the fact that, you know, the, 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 the fees are extortionate and, and the fact remains that when one looks at the global face of gambling, when one looks at what the Gambling Commission actually have to regulate, there were 2,900 independent operators um, on the Gambling Commission's website and they had nine revocations since 2011. That means nine people have had their licenses taken away. Like, so I think it's Bodog. And right. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. 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 And their, their licenses taken away because they weren't paying their customers and all the rest of it. Yeah. Well, which 
is a success rate, if you call it that, a justification rate of yeah. far less than one percent, about 0.3 of a percent of actual revocations of license of independence. So therefore their you know their purpose, their very means for spending their 17 million pounds worth of fees, which is basically their salaries, um, shows a very low success rate because of course the majority of the fees um, are gained from the independents, not from the major firms. Yeah. The, the compliance issues involved with large and successful companies like say William Hill are massive. They're running bingo operations, they're running fob tees, and these are the companies with the most compliance issues, issues to deal with. Now what they've argued is that, well, we'll deal with it in-house in order to avoid the gambling, their share of the Gambling Commission's costs. William Hill have successfully argued, and Labrooks and Corals and Betfair and all the rest of them have argued that what they will do is they will self-regulate. And so therefore, the Gambling Commission take the view, well, uh, we don't need to charge them as much as we charge a little independent because um, regulating one shop is the same as regulating the other 2,300 shops and the same as view of their online and things like that. Now, the fact remains that they, would, they will spend the majority of their time dealing with compliance issues with companies like Bet365. But the investment that the on-course bookmakers have made in themselves these days, yes. these electronic boards are like seven or eight thousand pounds each. So most bookmakers are standing there in twelve thousand pounds worth of equipment, and then they pay support charges and everything else like that. So they, so they made a substantial investment in the customer ideal. Uh, the only problem is that they've gone too far, um, and so you know, and I would like racetracks to um, look at ways to restrict their activities with betting exchanges yeah. on track yeah. because they have specialised software that allows them to um, negotiate wages. Uh, with exchange at super fast speed, yeah. which means I bet next to um, uh, uh, Martin of Leicester at Ascot the other day, and if a horse was 2.1, he would be 11 to 10, literally 11 to 10. I don't know how he does it. Um, I did observe to him at the time that he was doing the south, and I, said, I asked him what car he drove. And Martin confirmed that he's driving around in a station wagon, and I do believe that he will drive around in a station wagon for the rest of his life, because betting that way has very little, um, very little return. Um, but that basically, he can do that because you know he can negotiate bets with the exchange at super fast speed. Well, I'd love the situation to be where the racetracks use their power and stop to that activity. I'm in shock. He went to Leicester. No, no, Martin of Leicester, I'm oh, talking right. about. It. I'm not sure I know where it is on the map. Oh, that's, that was the stage of shock there for a West Country. Yeah. <laughs> the final point I would make about the Gambit Commission is the fact that all these new licenses that they are reaping, all these transitional fees of eight, nine hundred pounds that they're charging all these companies, and all these new website fees that they're collecting from companies based out in Malta and Gibraltar and Ireland and everywhere else on the planet that they're now collecting from people and new operators that have to come in house haven't seen a reduction in the fees from the, that the independents pay, not a, not a penny. So they're gaining all that extra money, all these extra fees, literally millions, have come in you know, that will come in this year and next year in extra fees. But no reduction. Why? Why no reduction? Well, point of consumption is, it is a good thing. I mean, I agree with it. I agree with the concept. Um, and just explain the concept. The concept, the concept is a customer in the UK who bets in the UK, regardless of who he bets with and where, the, the, the firm that takes the bet must be regulated and licensed in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom and fall under Gambling Commission, Gambling Commission um, control. But if that means that, you know, gambling commission control means that I have to subsidize that and, yeah. and, co and all my colleagues out there have to subsidize these big firms in terms of the fees that I pay. I mean, you know, try to, to, try, to try to equate uh, an organization like mine or somebody running a couple of betting shops that wants to try to expand their business and, mm -hmm. and offer an app and offer a website and whatever and turn around to them and say, well, we want 15, 16,000 pounds for you for the you know, for a fees, which means we're effectively employing a member of staff at the Gambling Commission. That's, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm paying for another member of staff at the Gambling Commission, and I haven't, I've seen them, sorry, once in three years. Once in three years. They come around for a cup of coffee, they have a chat, they ask me, uh, you know, uh, 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 has anybody self-excluded? Nonsensical questions. Just things that they sit around the table and they dream up. Things to do.
because there is no compliance issues for firms like mine. We can't do business with 16 year olds, you know, off the street. We don't have any property, we don't have any video, we don't have any roulette. You know, we don't let people sit there all night funding their accounts with credit cards, emptying all their credit card accounts, not debit cards, credit cards. We don't allow them to do that. So therefore we are no compliance issue. But thanks Jeff, give me 16,000 pounds to regulate you. Well, I'd like to see a return on my money, and I'm not getting it. Okay. But by the time we've, I've edited this, you will have paid your bill. The letter that you tweeted, the bill you tweeted, mm. I presume you will have. I will have paid my, I will have paid my bill. <laughs> paid and your I will, subs. I, I will have paid my subs under duress, but that won't be where it ends then. Oh, oh. Were there such subs in your dad's day? 20 pounds. 20 what? 20 pounds. Your dad paid to be a bookie. 20 pounds. It was £20 an annual fee, £20, and I believe for a certain amount of time um, you only had to apply back to the, you'd have to reapply, but reapply for your licence every two years, and you would pay £20 every two years. What could be done? What one positive thing could be done to lift the spirits of punters and make, bring, bring it's, more it's, in? That is down to, it is down to um, the control of the ruling body. Right now they don't have enough control, they don't have enough power to force the racetracks back from Saturday racing because we have too much, you know, we have too many jewels on a Saturday and too little to offer on a Wednesday or a Thursday. And, you know, and I think in order to make the punters walk and want to walk in to have a bet on British racing on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, we have to encourage the racetracks somehow to go back to racing midweek. The problem is of course they're gonna make they're gonna engender more corporate spend on a Saturday. Yeah boxes are gonna be fuller and I think that's a very big issue for the race tracks. I'd like to see for example in the Sedgefield team I'd like to see centralised stewarding. I, mean, I don't know why we're spending all this money having local stewards with all their, you know, vague you know, their vague decisions in terms of like one lot of stewards will vote one way and another lot of stewards will see it another way. I think it would be much better and cheaper um, and more professional if we just had a panel sitting, you know, in a centralised office at my Auburn and, and give them the control of every rest. Why do we, why do we need why do we need a Colonel Blimp sitting at Sedgefield of an afternoon turning around and saying, Yeah, 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 that flag was waved, we'll ban them all. Why can't we have a you know, why can't we have a nice, sensible, clear system that doesn't cost the same amount of money? In the last year, I've noticed in the last year online and via your tweets and such like on your website, you have been trying different things. You have been trying things that perhaps I never thought you would. In Bonus junkies. Yeah, you've, 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 <laughs> you've tried things that I would expect from the big boys. We, we, have yes, they worked we, out? How have they worked out? No, no, it was an unmitigated disaster. But I don't know, I mean, if there's any did? bookmakers out there that, you know, that are thinking about you know, trying this tactic, don't. What Basically what we did is we looked at what the big firms are doing and and what they do is they offer sign-up bonuses. So a customer opens an account, and they either match a wager that the yeah. customer has, or maybe if the you know if the, the customer loses fifty pounds, maybe they'll give them another twenty pounds or something like that. And they will put money in his account and all the rest of it. It's quite carefully worded and everything else like that. So we tried it for a while. Um, it was both amusing and expensive at exactly the same time. Um, but basically, what happens is we offered say thirty pounds. So we said to uh, we said to a customer, well, if you have a, you must deposit sixty. Uh, but on your first wager, we'll give you half your stake back up to thirty pounds. So what we found is we had literally hundreds and thousands of people who opened up accounts and deposited exactly sixty pounds. In other words, to get the put 60 pounds or something and get the full 30 pounds back so in other words having 60 pound bet for 30 pounds and if it got beat get 30 pound back <coughs> which is all lovely the problem with that was that we you get no loyalty from those people absolutely not there that's why we term we coined the phrase in our office bonus junkies and as soon as they opened up their account and they wanted to deposit 60 pounds that was it we just marked them up bonus junkies and they would come on, they would have a few bets, some would win, some would lose. Overall, of course, it would cost us as a business, you know, because we were making, um, you know, a substantial investment in, you know, in new business. Um, and they would basically exhaust their funds and or collect their check and you would never hear from them again. They have absolutely no loyalty. Um, they're not regular, they're not regular customers. They're not 
loyal customers and so um, in the future we will be looking at different schemes to um, you know to keep our customers I mean we we have a scheme in place right now to reward our customers in terms of like giving the money back over a, a quarter so every quarter we will give money back to yeah. our customers and every time a customer pays us we'll give them you know minimum of five percent back on their on their payments our credit clients and deposit clients so we give them immediate credit back you know for every payment they make so we are continuously trying and we'll come up with something different next year but what it won't be is just a simple we'll give you money scheme you know if you have a bet with us we'll give you 30 pound back because that's just unmitigated disaster they're just basically uh, nothing other than a lot of them are just you know, as, as we call them bonus junkies but the big boys consider it's worth the big boys do consider it wor the worth um, but, well one of the reasons is because they're running uh, a different operation to us yeah. obviously we're focused mainly on racing and sports whereas you know yeah, large and successful them. firms like William Hill are, are based mainly on roulette and casino and things like that and machines one, one thing I have noticed you've changed is um for all your disparaging remarks about the great game of soccer in years past. Oik ball, as you call it. Oik ball, yeah. You're forever at it now, promoting football and football bets. And well, football. yeah, no, I mean, obviously football is, a, football is, a, I mean, I don't have to like the sport to bet on it. <laughs> I mean, I don't like to, I mean, I couldn't, I wouldn't watch a 10 pin bowling match to save my life, but you know, I'll, bet, I'll offer a bet on it. Um, but football's a huge betting medium, you can't ignore it. And it's, in, it's on the increase. As racing decreases, football is taking up the slack. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, and we've, we've, we've worked hard on our markets. We've, we've reduced our over round on football markets to 100, around right about 104 right now. And we're offering many more markets and things like that, um, you know, on our website and through the app. And we're also working to develop the app, make it a bit better. Um, so yeah, we, we are continuously trying to evolve but in our own way. Yeah. But we, I think what guys get with us or girls get with us when they bet with us basically is is a better feel of service. You know, we, we give them the prices and we give them the service. We give them refunds if the your horse gets beat by a neck or less <coughs> on any right. race. Right. Um, you know, we give them best odds guaranteed on any horse on the show, you know, and we give them money back when they deposit. And all but you were, so we try. You weren't doing that a year ago, were you? No. We had a conversation about best odds guaranteed and you yeah, no, no, pooed no. it. No, I've weakened. I've weakened. I know. I don't think my old man would have weakened, but I have. You tend to remember the days where you lose money. Right. I mean, I remember being, you know, attending Cheltenham and after three races on the Friday, uh, which was the Gold Cup day, and being a quarter of a million down. But I, I had a company, um, you know, um, uh, betting with me during the course of that week, and they were doing best part of uh, 50 grand and we're talking the Denman years you know, five six years ago when business was very busy and, and I did lay two uh, two horses one were probably not best advice to lay one was uh, a horse called Cato Star uh, and the other one that one was a horse called Wichita Alignment which ever since Wichita Alignment one. I mean, I won't speak to McCoy again, ever again, <laughs> ever. As a betting medium, what's the Grand National like for the Jeff Banks type operation? It's huge, yeah. it's huge. So I would say it has to be nigh on number one event in that we have the majority of my customers, I would expect them to have a bet on the Grand National. Right. You know, we always do a little tonic for them. We always do a bet for the, what we call for the missus. And we allow them with a free five pounds, or five pounds each way. Or How politically right. correct of you, Jeff. Politically correct. A bet for the missus. A bet for the missus. <laughs> so basically, um, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, their, their, their sex, but they can come on and have their free wager on the national. And usually they're pretty fair with me and have a couple of other bets as well to help pay for it. So, you know, everybody bets a few horses in the national. So we do that as a little touch, you know. Uh, but the national is by far and away the, the biggest bet. It's a good day for you, usually. Uh, mm. Depends. Is it is it is it highly pro it has been the last few years right. because the places have been good. Right. Not just about it's not just no, sometimes, no, you no. Can, sometimes you can have a thirty three to one chance win the national and think you must have got must have got bundles at the race, but the, if the places are bad you'll lose. Yeah, yeah. Definitely lose. Especially now we're offering five places. And you look forward to Cheltenham? Always. It's a, it's the it's the pinnacle of British racing, I think for me, but as a bookmaker and I think for all the people that really, really love the sport, I think Cheltenham is the meeting that they want to attend. 
Um, obviously, Royal Ascot is uh, is an iconic event, mm. or whatever. But you'll get a, a, a far more much a, a, a varying mix of people that go to attend there. So it's it's um, more of a social event than a betting event. You know, whereas Cheltenham is a it's pretty much a pure betting event. People go there, go there to have a bet. You know, they drive and run around in that ridiculous tweed, and and I just think it's a I just think it's a it's a fantastic racetrack as well. You know, yeah, it is really is a you know it's not often, and I think that's what catches a lot of a lot of you know well touted horses out. I mean, I'm delighted to see Forheen and the new one win so well on the weekend against a load of trees. Because of course everybody will be shortening them up for Cheltenham, imagining they can't possibly get beat, and that's what happens. They run up against, you know, yeah. run up against complete rubbish, um, and of course the situation will be completely different when they'll get to the champion hurdle because they'll be going twice as fast for two miles, running up against entirely better horses over the rolling hills of Cheltenham. That's why we get different results. And if we're sat here 12 months from now, um, you won't have moved to Gibraltar, I presume. Uh, for reasons you stated previously. No, I won't have moved to Gibraltar. I will, have, I will have continued my assault on the Gambit Commission until I get somebody in at that organisation or in the DCMS to recognise, you know, that things in business and in life should be fair.